He said the board observed that there are possible benefits of governance merger, but that positive productive relationships among the school districts do not exist. And I find this interesting in the context of what we just heard earlier about in the idea of is it relationships or systems? So um, could you just speak about that? Because it is can be adult relationships getting in the way of what admittedly from the board would be actual benefits. So is there any move, and I know you're just joining, um, to try to, to move some of those relationships to systems uh, for benefits of children? Like some candid opinion. Candid or opinion would be fine. Candid opinion would be fine. Okay, yeah. so we have we have had fairly autonomous boards for a long time, um, and uh, they're of different sizes. They're run in different ways. Some some simple. We have uh, some some very strong principles that, that work very well with their board in a very autonomous way, uh, and there are. Uh, Boards that, that like the way it is and don't want it to change. Uh, there are other boards, uh, Red Bank Elementary Board that we're on, has is striving towards a, a, a more hands-off approach to governance. We want to be we, uh, drive our, our, our governance through uh, vision, mission, and uh, policy governance. Uh, we want to uh, allow those those people that are that are experts in education to be running our schools and not not. Uh, us community members who really don't have the time to dedicate to to understand many things like like curriculum development. Um, there are other districts that have been very hands-on in their governance of the school. They uh, they have meetings even during the school day. They're, they're there um, uh, in a very hands-on approach to it, where the, that's a traditional uh, model for what they consider success or. Uh, community-based schooling, um, and there's a real difference there. And there's no the, in the structure that is a supervisory union where we're sharing our executive officer between uh, districts that have this, this community-supported uh, school system and another district that has a has a leader-supported or education leader-supported school system where we're, where we're trying to leave them in the hands of those people. That, that superintendent is, is, is split between two visions and missions, uh, and it makes the governance of the, of the greater uh, supervisory union difficult. Um, and those, that's where those contentious relationships will seem to fall. Any questions? All right. So, anything else that. We have worked exhaustively on this uh, for three years. Uh, we have been asked to do what we ask our students to do. We have been asked to solve a problem, to potentially look for a solution that's outside of our comfort zone. And uh, we welcome that and know that we have really uh, worked very hard and exhaustively these past three years, and we appreciate your time and your consideration today. Thank you for your effort and time. We understand. Thanks. All right, so next we have to Newbury coming up, so part of that. And so three representatives from Newbury.
your information and then leave us some time for questions. That would be great. Sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah. We even practiced a couple of times. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> so we can keep the 10 minutes, I hope. Um, okay. On behalf of the Newbury School Board, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about our alternative governance structure proposal. In accordance with Act 46, RT Supervisory Union was expanded on July 1st of this year to incorporate the existing Blue Mountain SU. The Secretary of Education has further proposed a unified union school district by merging the boards of Blue Mountain, Bradford Elementary, Oxbow High School, and Newbury Elementary. We firmly believe that this is in the educational interest of our students at Newbury Elementary, a pre K through sixth grade school remains governed by its independent school board within our newly expanded supervisory union. Here are seven key reasons. Number one, loss of flexibility and local responsiveness in educational program, programming. Excuse me. Number two, precedent in granting school districts with circumstances similar to Newbury's independent status under the alternative government structure. Number three, consequential financial implications for Newbury taxpayers setting conditions for friction within the merged board. Number four, disruption of an extraordinary sta extraordinarily stable and supportive existing relationship between the school and its community. Number five, limited gains from future collaboration because of effective collaboration in the past and new opportunities for, future, for further collaboration under the Just Expanded Supervisory Union. Number six, anticipated savings through avoiding duplication in SU staffing that has just been put in place under the new SU. And number seven, the likelihood that a neighboring district's actions will cause the proposed merged district to fall well below the Act 46 goals with respect to compatibility in the number of students. <clears throat> uh, brief expanding on each of these items. Number one, like all schools, the Newbury Elementary sometimes needs a higher degree of flexibility and responsiveness to address its unique circumstances. Among many possible examples, Newbury has recently had to address a cluster of students determined to disrupt the classroom activities by acting out. Most of these students do not require special education, but rather are dealing with social and emotional issues. In response, the local board, principal, and staff with full parental support have just established a separate multi-age classroom with an experienced teacher to work with this small group of students until they can participate productively in a regular classroom. We believe this kind of creative response to an immediate need would be far less likely with a merge board preoccupied with five schools needs. Number two, we are aware that the other school districts with characteristics similar to Newbury's were not recommended for Act 46 consolidation. For instance, the Secretary did not recommend a merger between Woodbury and Hodworth because it was not, and I quote, not clear whether there is sufficient educational or fiscal benefit to do so, while the other intertwined relationships continue to exist, end quote. Our Bradford-Newbury situation appears to mirror Hodworth and Woodbury in that both will remain within the SU into the future, and both are surrounded by unlike structures, Walcott and Green in Greensboro, and Thetford and Wage River. Most important, both are of a scale so small that fiscal and educational opportunities can most readily be achieved through closer collaboration and cooperation within the SU without a unified board superstructure. Number three, Newbury taxpayers will be facing onerous increases in Newbury's, uh, excuse me, onerous increases. Newbury's discipline budgeting has resulted in the lowest cost per pupil at $12,910, and the lowest tax rate of $1.40 of the four towns in the village proposed to district. Under the proposed unified district, Newbury taxpayers would be asked to assume long-term liabilities disproportionate to their own modest school debt. In particular, Bradford's continuing $1,150,000 bond will contribute considerably more to the combined tax rate than Newbury's own $120,000 long-term debt, which will be extinguished within three years. Even more important, BMU's teacher contract has the highest staff pay levels of the proposed district, and the other schools, including Newbury, will have to assume those levels. 
All these additional costs were voted on and are being expended by communities other than New York. And the facilities and the programming was not intended to benefit Newbury students. The resulting tax bill for Newbury, with little or no visible benefit, would surely set up condi conditions for discord among the communities and their school boards, which have enjoyed cooperative relations for decades. The proposed merger, number four, the proposed merger would undermine the stability of a community school relations in indirectly staffing, morale, and educational quality. Our current school board members have served for 22 years, 10 years, and three years, respectively. Our principal with seven years of service has the longest tenure in the SU. Our town has voted down school budgets only once in the past four decades. Community support has been demonstrated time and time again through programs like Grow a Row, in which home gardeners contribute produce to the school breakfast and lunch program. We believe distancing the high, local, and often personal contact of the voters with the school endangers one of our school's strongest assets, enthusiastic community support. Number five, effective July 1st, the RMT Supervisory Union has expanded to include Blue Mountain School with a highly experienced but almost entirely new OUSU staff. The administration now consists of a new superintendent, assistant superintendent, financial manager, curriculum coordinator, and even a new receptionist. The team is demonstrably committed to fostering further collaboration. In fact, the new superintendent and financial manager have moved directly from BMU, thereby guaranteeing familiarity with the district's expansion and facilitating cooperation. We see few of any educational or financial benefits remaining from the proposed merger that cannot be achieved more directly through collaboration. Number six, the expanded OESU has already achieved significant savings, most notably through the elimination of duplicate expenses for the superintendent, the business manager, and other SU roles. Additional financial efficiencies through the unified union district are likely to be far less material. Number seven, yesterday in an advisory vote, the citizens of Blue Mountain Union District voted 443 to 183 to close its high school and offer school choice if a merger is forced upon the district. Given that overwhelming sentiment, we believe it probable that in the near future the proposed district will fail to meet the compatible configuration and minimum student numbers of Act 46. Without Blue Mountain School, Blue Mountain becomes a K-8 school, like our adjacent U36 Union School, Waste River. This K-8 arrangement will be incompatible with the proposed unified district. Only 681 equalized students will comprise the proposed unified union district, failing the Act 46 threshold. On behalf of our students, we respectfully submit that these reasons individually and particularly collectively <coughs> argue overwhelmingly for our proposed alternative governance structure. Combining our newly expanded RT supervisory union with the continuation of existing local school boards. Thank you very much for your consideration. Um, all right, yes, I'll. So, clarifying question for the board and also perhaps for the secretary. I'm just trying to rationalize there's a statement in here that the Secretary of Education has further proposed a unified union school district by merging the boards of Blue Mountain Union. And you talked a little bit about the Blue Mountain Union, but when I'm looking at the report from the secretary, um, the primary recommendation is a merger of Oxbow, Bradford, and Newbury. So am I missing something? Well, I understand that well, BMU has recently been assigned to Orange's supervisory and that occurred after the publication of the secretary's plan. But that's just an assignment, but the well, yeah, without assignment under which, which, term term law, which can yeah. be changed, but the secretary's yeah. initial recommendation was for the for the SU. for the three right. districts. And to leave that <clears throat> by itself. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, wait for yeah. that move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was my understanding. I'm, I'm not absolutely positive yeah. here, but my understanding was that in the Blue Mountain information, that Blue Mountain was directed to now become part of the force merger. So it was two separate spots in the report. There are two. Yeah, there, there are two separate spots, and, and but I think um, 
they, they sort of can stand independent. I think there are a few different options. So I guess the question I have for you is, um, if, if we just leave Blue Mountain out of the equation and let's just assume that they could be reassigned to a different SU, are, are, you, are you still opposed to the concept of the three districts merging together? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I think we sort of addressed that in one of the bullet points as far as the economy of scale. You know, if you look at other options or um, situations that have happened, like Hardwood and um, Woodbury, the Secretary just points to that there wasn't enough economy to make that push towards it. In our proposals back to the state when we did our alternative governance, we suggested that really our best way forward would be to include the MU because of that ability to bring in more students to create more of a, a governance structure as far as if you're going to look at merging, we see this as really the better way forward if the MU is not part of the function and we struggle to see okay. why that would make sense. So if, if, if the merger included BMU, you'd be supportive of, of a merger? As long as we can keep our own board, so not necessarily merging the, the the entire piece, but rather trying to move this governance structure further would be more attractive with the MU part of it because of the numbers. With just the three of us, the numbers we just didn't feel like the numbers were going to work. Because with with the uh, Blue Mountain, was it brings the number up to seventeen hundred, yeah. um, including Thetford, and right. without Thetford, it's the thirteen. And then you run into, we run into the tax implications of that. So it just, when we went through our 706B study, it became very unattractive financially for our communities. It was, it was really not. And that's why the study broke up, because it just didn't fiscally make sense in our tax figure that we're not supporting it. And, and, and sorry, I just want to follow up because I want to be really clear on what your wishes yeah. are. Yeah. So if, if BM, when you, you I didn't quite hear you. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure I understand. When you, you were talking about the governance structure with BMU, are you talking about a supervisor union with everybody continuing to have their own school? Okay, so yes. you're not in favor of one supervisory district. But okay. you do like the idea of the SU including Blue Mountain. Yes. Yeah. With, Absolutely. Yes. But with yeah. but with each, but you still all each have your own boards. Yes, yeah. and, and our. Uh, our biggest thing is that we just feel right now with all of the changes that we've going on going on, OESU itself has had many struggles for many years. And we feel like we're right now on the cusp of true opportunity. We're we're at personally. And I feel I feel that going forward with that course merge would jeopardize that opportunity. And and so we feel like if we can all come together under the each individual board and work towards a mutual goal. There's true opportunity, um, and, and that's what we feel like is the best path forward. And, and what's the distance between the two high schools? Is it 15 miles, 17 miles? Approximately 17 miles. But that BMU includes obviously like Rotten, and yeah. they're much further in and out. So the driving distance is. Deceiving, yeah, <laughs> as it exactly. always is in Vermont, yeah. right? So you can drive in a straight line. You do a lot easier. You just fly there. Don't get that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's an app. On the question of bargaining, you assume you were mentioning about the salary schedules. Um, my understanding is that the BMU, the BMU is part of supervising at this point. You're going to be bargaining collectively. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up with a single contract, or even if you achieve a single contract, a single salary schedule. So you still could bargain separate contracts, just have to bargain collectively. And even if you do come up with a single contract, you can still have separate schedules. So just a Yes. Yeah. 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 So correct me if I'm wrong, because lots of moving parts here. There's a new superintendent, right, for we as of last month. Right. Yes, and and our new superintendent has to address previously uncomplying mandates like special education and transportation. So I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking about what you just said about the cusp of opportunity. And I'm wondering if you thought about whether or not the superintendent is going to be able to address these new opportunities when there are going to be multiple different if your if the if your proposal stands or your council stands. 
will your superintendent be able to do the work? Because I think my concern when I hear superintendents having to respond to lots of different boards directives and agendas, can that superintendent really be the educational leader that we would like him to be? I guess I'll address that. Um, because we were aware of Ellen Nisley and the new finance manager coming from BMU, there was a tremendous level of excitement with regards to the leadership we believe we now have. Um, our board, which we were going to submit to you tomorrow, has come up with a proposal for that would be used as a process for future OESU meetings, which I believe will address many of the things that you were talking about. I think, unfortunately, because of the fact that we have had so many changes in interim people doing the job. I've been on the board, I'm the 22 year person. So, um, I've seen a lot of history. And I can tell you that when issues were brought to the board and well presented by the superintendent or a member of his or her staff, I cannot recall ever having a situation where the board didn't give its full cooperation to get it done. I think because of all the chaos and confusion, and we were also in the middle of con trying to do a new teacher contract when the special ed information came out, we tried, we applied for a waiver and tried to put that information off on that decision. And then we were in a position where we had an interim superintendent, which we didn't really determine until already end of the school year. So things were a bit hectic to say the least. What we're proposing is through the Act 46, and I have to tell you right up front, this has been a very long three or four years. But on the other hand, it was the right thing to do in our mind that it said it forced us to sit back and say, are we doing the right thing now? And what do we need to do in the future? So I believe with our suggested uh, meeting schedule and how we're going to put things together, I believe we can change things dramatically, and I believe those issues with regards to transportation and special ed, if you put the right people focused on it and the board understands they were empowering people to get this done, that we're gonna solve all these things. I, I have complete confidence that we will. And, and I guess what I need to also say that when we, it was mentioned earlier in the last report by the Oxbow Vice Craft Report, we had two public meetings with those four boards, the BMU and the other boards involved. And we had a, a lively discussion, I guess would be a nice way of putting it. But one of the questions that was asked in both meetings was, please tell us what we cannot accomplish by working collaboratively that would be accomplished in forcing this merger. I asked it myself twice. The first meeting I received no answer. The second meeting I received was just easier. Well, if you consider what we wrote and what we talked about in our proposal, um, we've been working on this for three to four years now. Uh, I would really appreciate you giving full consideration to not basing your decision based on what's easier. Um, because we have worked very, very hard for what we have at New England Elementary School. And we believe we're moving in a very good direction. And we would like to continue. I have two. Mark, do you have I, I guess you, you just asked, you know, one of the things about what can be accomplished. I, I think we heard earlier today, and we've heard it in previous meetings, that one of the things that happens when you bring adults together as one school board as opposed to multiple school boards is that it focuses the conversation more. And um, it allows the administrators <coughs> of the school system to have everybody around the table at the same time. So I, I guess that, that would be the answer to that, that question that you're asking. Yes, and, and, and I think, once again, I'm referring to the, to the additional information that's going to supply you tomorrow, you will see in that proposal that that's exactly the I I don't think we do enough of that. We have done that in various opportunities over the 20 years I've been on the board, where Bradford and Newman and I have sat down at, at meetings on, on occasions to deal with additional uh, topics of interest. There's no reason why we couldn't continue to do that, but our point is, is that we don't believe forcing inquiry into a merger is going to make that any easier. We actually need to make it more difficult. Oh, and if I can say, I'm sorry, to sort of go back to the question about how could, would it be 
easier to do this all at once versus sort of spreading it out, I think, is part of the question. What we sort of, and, and, and have had these conversations and meetings as far as we have this special ed issue that needs to be dealt with very, very quickly. Our concern as board members as well is there's serious conversations that have to happen if a forced merge is set upon us. We have to discuss articles of group. We have to move ourselves forward in a governance structure. We have to come up with voting regulations and how all of those things are going to be set up. Those are intense, very emotional conversations that need to take place. So that support for those conversations is also going to need to be there. And so which one would be more draining on a newly formed SU staff, whether, you know, and it depends on which way you look at it. Personally, I think that emotional conversation of articles of agreement trying to move forward into that is a, is a much harder thing to support and a much more draining thing. Whereas if we can continue to work the way we have, give them the time to get through the administration stuff, and then try to collaboratively come up with those things, I think it gives us a better option for success. I think we only have one minute left, but sorry. Um, Oh, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, really quick question. So how do you propose it if you're to continue with independent governance structures to sort of control the, the variability in your student counts? You mean in terms of the, the, the um, number of students attending Newbury Elementary? Yeah, just in, well, in terms of the, within the governance structure, your equalized pupil count, one of the challenges is when you have a smaller governance structure, you have a lot, you tend to have a lot more variability, which, Says your tax rates, you know, not sort of a yo-yo effect. So how do you propose to sort of, without the ability to aggregate those students, how do you propose to sort of um, level off the, the variability? Well, as a board, we've taken a number of steps over the last few years. One of them was uh, when we had a retirement in the lunch program, for instance. We went and hired the Abbey Group to now provide our lunch program, which has provided savings for the school and help keep the cost down because we were running a twenty thousand dollar a year deficit on the lunch program and not on the paper. Uh, we just had a vacancy at a nighttime custodian for the school. We have just gone out and contracted a company to um, come in and provide that service for us so we won't be paying any additional benefits or or the other associated costs for that. Um, That's Oh. Yeah, so it would just be a lot of people. Oh, all right. Yeah, no, I'm oh, sorry. I thought I said something I, wrong. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's even all the time for a little bit. Even all the time. And it's mindful that we have a, a whole list of people okay. right here. And no, and we think it's yeah. And again, we can take any additional documentation. Okay. And so we just send that my way. And so to make sure we're on the board that that'd be very helpful. We really appreciate your time. Yes, thank, thank you for having me.
Is that open? Yeah, there's a seat right in the middle here. Uh, there's also some up front. Uh, I see some in the back. Oh, over on this side, there's going to be some. That would be very helpful. Thank you. I, it's amazing to have this many people come out and want to be excited about education. So I think that's the, that's the good part in this part of that. Um, so let's, I think now you two can you have you got the part. So if you want to keep track for us, thank you. And if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourselves and your name for the record. And again, if you do your presentation, then you need time for us to ask the questions. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Matthew DeGrosse. I'm a member of the Doty Elementary School Board in Worcester, and I'm also the chair of the Washington Central SE Board. I'm Florida Smith. I'm a member of the Eastmont Elementary School Board, and I'm a member of this board. Scott Thompson, New 32 board from Calais, and Matthew Somadis, um, he and Fleur as well. Uh, Matthew was the chair of our Section 9 committee and Fleur of our 706B committee. Okay. So we're going to take turns and sure. try to take on more of the next question. Yeah. So good morning. Thank you for listening to us today. We know that you have received a recommendation from the AO. But we're here today to ask you to review your alternative proposal and dig a little deeper into why you submitted an alternative proposal. It is easy to tell a single story for all districts. You have been immersed in this process for a long time, and we have been described to you as the poster child of soil edition. But we're here, but we're more complex than what you have seen. We are human beings, and there is never a single story that fits all. In my experience with working closely with our five communities and as chair of the 706B committee, in I came to understand that we first needed to build trust between our communities in order to move forward. We have come a long way with this, and we all understand and believe that we, what we all want is what is best for all our kids across our elementary schools, middle school, and high school. You may be assuming that our request for an alternative proposal is just about the adults and not the kids. However, the work that we're doing now is aligned with all the goals of Act 46, and it's truly what is best for kids. The work that our schools are taking part in supports a strong multi-tier system of supports in all our schools. We all are working hard to make sure good first instruction happens in every classroom, interventions are in place for those who are behind, and supports are in place to help students exceed the expectations. We're supporting strong professional development for teachers and giving them time to collaborate and plan so they can teach with intention. We're starting to see small gains in closing the children gap in literacy. I know that you're looking at some of our small schools, and we believe that organically changes will happen without needing to be forced into something. I hope you do realize that changes will evolve over time, but if the state forces us into a conservation that is not right for us at this moment, it will put the brakes in all the good work happening now. The children will be the ones that suffer, and our leadership team has worked so hard to move us forward in the right direction. To give you an example, just two weeks ago, in August, August 2nd, we had our first full board retreat with the majority of our board members across the schools attending. Nate Levinson from District Management Group facilitated the retreat, expanding and strengthening the supports for struggling students. We are already doing a lot of these best practices, and more work is happening as we speak. We came out of that retreat with an even better understanding of our commonalities across our schools, but also with an understanding of all the work that still needs to happen. As board members, we're supporting our leadership team, we're ambassadors for the work in our communities, and we're proposing budgets that support that work. Our teachers and staff do their best to make sure our kids develop and believe the growth mindset. The school boards of Washington Supervisory Union are committed to this growth mindset too, and will continue to learn to seek input to support best practices and to provide the best education in group. We will bring something of value to the table. We will continue to share a, a, an understanding of the equity issues across our schools. This proposal brings together head and heart. It focuses on the good that we have going on right now. The alternative is an affirmation of that work and is what is best for our uh, most yes. oh, this You can use this one too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thanks, Dora. Um, we're here in large part because greatly differing levels of indebtedness as the law would say. Um, it makes it so that a unified union district formed out of our six existing school districts simply cannot meet all five goals of Act 46. 
We're left with the sole alternative that Act 4 is actually true, which is defined as supervisory union with member districts. This alternative can be all five votes of Act 46. And as Fleur was explaining, it actually does meet all five votes of Act 46. I'm not going to rehash what you already have on our agenda sheet. Um, there's just too much. Um, I will, however, use it as a nifty acid test of the process of control. Um, it serves well in this, in this regard because it's objective, it's measurable, it's consequential, and it's devilishly tricky. Over the past three years, it's tripped up way better people than me. Um, part of the reason for this is that it seems like it ought not to be an issue at all. I mean, debt in the wider world of mergers is so mundane and commonplace. It's even in chapter one of Mergers for Dummies. That's for real. And what reinforces this idea of, don't ask me how I know that, um, what reinforces you know, this tendency to view it as you know, basically a trifling issue is that it's very easy to fall for some of the hip fix that are in the law. Um, one that I just mentioned, Section 723 of Title 16, which seems to say, sure, you may solve your debt problem. But then, when you actually try to do so, you find that other parts of the law withhold key tools that you need in order to make a real solution. Our 706B committee looked at all of the mergers, the recent mergers, and their handling of their debt issues. And in every case, debt was pooled. There was no other arrangement other than complete uh, unification of, um, of indebtedness. So I'm um, just likely to consider two approaches that I have encountered in this saga. Approach number one, uh, a state level authority lets you speak your piece. And she says to you, your analysis doesn't sound right to me, but I'll, I'll look into it. And then weeks later, she gets back to you and says, I can hardly believe I'm saying this, but you may actually be onto something. What can we do to fix it? Approach number two, the state level authority says to you, there's nothing wrong with the preferred structure or the legal framework it's embedded in. They're perfectly fine, just as they are. The real problem is you, you short-sighted little school boards. This is why you need to be relegated once and for all to the dustbin of history. Now, um, which approach passes that acid test in your mind? Um, openness, humility, pragmatism? Or what I'm afraid feels to me many of us like uh, arrogant, disdainful dogmatism. The first approach was the approach that our legislators took. The second approach, um, you can read in its unabridged version, beginning on page 55 of the proposed statewide plan. And if you miss it there, it reappears multiple times throughout the plan. So I know this is very hard. Um, the authors of the plan are nice folks. They're very smart, very hardworking, friends and colleagues. Um, the ones I know, I like too. But this is very far from their best work. It's important, and you owe it to them, you owe it to yourselves, you owe it, blah, blah, I think to us, all of us, to cast a cold, exacting eye on this plan, as if perhaps you were a judge. And considering that in our case, we're looking at $3 million present value and potential confiscation looming over two towns, it's not impossible that that might come before a judge at some point. 
I'm just mindful of time. Yeah, I, 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 it's almost nine minutes. Almost nine. Okay. I just want to make sure that you have time for a question so you can get your. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say before I hand it off to Matthew, may I uh, say something nice about that? Would that spoil the effect? It's your time. So it's your time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, right. Uh, the suggestion of closer ties with Cabot and Twinfield is um, uh, is welcome, and uh, I think we have a very capable superintendent and court administration who can uh, rise to the challenge of doing that. So anyway. Thank you, Matthew, for your eternal patience. Uh, I'll do my best to be extremely brief. Maybe 30 seconds. 30 seconds remaining. Uh, so I'll just reiterate a point that I think you already know, uh, which is that, as, other, as others have said, we've worked tremendously hard over the last three years on this issue, just put in countless hours. Uh, we took the law uh, quite seriously, and it's in Duncan and charge quite seriously. Tried to evaluate um, all the different options and, and uh, issues on their merits. Uh, we had a lot of disagreement, a lot of spirited discussion. Uh, in the end, though, uh, all six of our school boards uh, unanimously endorsed our AGS proposal uh, in the point of view that um, at this time and under these conditions, uh, we feel like a merger would be bad uh, for our schools and our school kids. Um, and that there's an alternative um, that. That would be less bad, I guess. Um, so just to note that we are unified and unanimous uh, in coming to you today. Um, so that's all. Thank you for all the questions. And, and what time? Just so I know what we're. Go on, uh, a little over nine minutes. Okay, so we have time for questions. So Oliver, if you want to get us started. Yeah, so the, the over. Well, the theme I was hearing a lot about from your testimony was uh, concerned debt and, and unequal distribution of debt. Uh, in a merger scenario, and I'm curious, in your 706B uh, study committee process, Act 46 um, envisioned and laid out in the statute uh, for the voluntary phase of the merger a number of supporting mechanisms to assist with that kind of transition. So there were a number of tax stabilization mechanisms, et cetera, to, to help districts come together and, and bring those varying financial obligations um, together so that the impact wasn't as great. And I'm just curious, that, did you do any of that financial analysis in the 706 study? Oh, yes. Um, in fact, it's reflected in, the, uh, in our Section 9 proposal. I think it's pages 30 to 33 or thereabouts. Yep. Um, there are charts and, and everything. Yes. And, and even so, even with those, um, if you've gone through the voluntary merger, even, the, even with those, the, um, you see the, the, the effects of indebtedness in our case last for 14 years. Um, the, the, the most um, important effect lasts for 14 years. And of course, the tax incentive lasts for only four or five. Um, and even with, even in year one, with the maximum tax incentives, um, there was no lowering of taxes for basically for two towns. So. John? Um, Magic wand. The debt problem goes away. Just I, I hypothesize that for a moment. Would you be eager to merge at that point? I, I think it's a little bit dangerous to engage in hypotheticals. Um, but I guess I would say that uh, uh, certainly if the debt magically went away or was solved in some, in some way, it certainly would be a lot easier for us to consider. So what are the other obstacles then? I think the other obstacle chiefly that we uh, noted uh, throughout our community engagement process and kind of assessing where people are at on this issue is that there's a tremendous amount of opposition uh, to the idea of consolidation. Uh, we took that pretty seriously and we felt that um, not just on its face but also as a probable impediment or challenge to implementing the merger successfully. So that would be the other, the other piece. Those you, being the two main reasons. I think you at least two of you, maybe all three of you, were here during the presentation by Addison Central. And uh, on the face of it, it would seem like their situation and yours are not terribly dissimilar. Uh, but for the debt question, uh, there were debt issues there, but they were 
perhaps more manageable. Um, there was opposition, there was skepticism. It's hard for me to see what the difference between the two situations is other than that. And to understand, you've heard what they had to say. It sounds like their, their situation sounds like what you're describing. What am I missing? I appreciate your uh, giving us an opportunity to address that. Um, I've said publicly uh, that to the extent that our school boards may currently be uh, challenged or not performing optimally with regard to uh, best outcomes or best practices, uh, that it relates far more to what I call culture than it does to structure or systems. Um, there was a comment made during the Edison Central presentation, for example, and it got picked up, I think, by some of the board members, um, that systems uh, really help to mitigate or um, you know, manage or uh, uh, make irrelevant the difficulties that might arise from challenging relationships. Um, in my experience as an executive administrator, a board member, someone who has served boards, uh, that just isn't true. Organizational culture, by which I mean the way that people are linked together in an organization, uh, will eat systems for lunch, and will eat strategic plans for lunch as well. Um, so there's just no substitute for doing the, the hard work of uh, building better relationships uh, with uh, across your school system. If you want to implement any initiative uh, that involves change, uh, you will have uh, people who are entrenched in their views uh, you'll have to overcome that inertia and your ability to do that will be based on the relationships that you have and the trust that you have with those people um, as much, if not more, in my opinion, as the systems that you uh, make out of place. So the, the steps, I think that what the Act 46 process has done has really brought us to a realization that our, um, our board culture has not been great and we have work to do in building and strengthening uh, and improving the quality of the relationships and therefore what we were able to achieve together. And we have a whole list of things that we've been doing to do that actually, uh, you know, over the last many months. Um, but so that's my answer to, to the question is that I'm not sure I agree entirely with uh, how uh, they characterized um, what is brilliant about consolidation in terms of systems eliminating the problems that you have with relationships. I have at least three questions of Peter's for so um, I'm, I'm um, wondering about community engagement. The 706B uh, committee um, requested a supermajority vote. Um, I believe it was uh, nine uh, out of 11. Um, I don't think we've seen that before in any of the proposals that come before us. Um, and um, no communities actually voted on any of the merger proposals, and that's compelling for us to see uh, in terms of records of, of votes and whatnot. Um, can, can you explain the process and, and, and when, whether the communities, the actual uh, general general populace uh, were engaged in this process and, and how was that conducted? Uh, we're engaged in the process. <laughs> <laughs> Why we've elected officials coming and representing the towns during this portion. And we do have less than two minutes, so let's go. And Kristen has almost answered your question for me. Um, the, um, I don't recall in 2015 when the Education Committee was drafting Act 46, or when it was voted on in the General Assembly, um, a remark by anyone in leadership at that time that this is such a consequential decision that we really ought to put it to a statewide referendum to see what the people think about it. Um, we respect uh, voter sentiment and uh, we sought it in many ways. Uh, I personally spoke to, either in groups or individually, uh, at least 150 uh, voters in Worcester, which were a small town that's about a third of our, our electorate, our voting uh, registered voters. Uh, we had many community forums. We posted every time uh, that there was a development. Uh, we did it. We, we commissioned and paid for. Uh, substantial uh, survey by a third party. 
Um, but in the end, uh, we didn't feel that a, a vote was required of us democratically. We also practice representative government. Uh, and our voters uh, elect us to uh, do our best and do what our conscience uh, dictate uh, for the good of schools and for the good of school kids. Um, and so that's why we, uh, we, we did not ultimately have a vote. And I guess if there's time, I would just have one other uh, short piece, which is that I was actually quite a strong advocate uh, for having a vote in our communities during our 706B process. And if you asked any of our 706B committee members, they'd probably say I was a broken record on the topic. Um, and it, but it wasn't because I felt it was necessary from a democratic standpoint, but rather tactically I felt that whatever the outcome of a, of a vote was, if we came to the state board with that eventually, uh, it would be compelling and virtually impossible to ignore, at least very difficult to ignore. Um, so that's why I was really surprised when the secretary's plan was issued, I saw that actually it was apparently quite easy to disregard or ignore or discount uh, votes that had happened, and I felt, in retrospect, quite glad that we did not waste our voters' time um, by putting them through that process. Yeah. Um, so, is that, yeah. Okay. Um, so, thank you for coming in. Um, and again, that's what, in giving us some information. So, thank you for coming in. Um, at this point, we are going to just take a quick break. Um, so, we will be coming back. Um, because we are running a little bit behind, we just have a five minute break and come back for the 1035. Thank you. If we could have people take their seats again, um, it just allows us to make sure we can hear everybody. Uh, just to remind, we'll come back with a break. We're going to do we three more uh, proposals that we're listening to and hear from elected officials. Uh, we have public to be heard. I want to make sure people there is the sign-in sheet over there. Everybody here can sign up so for, um, for the meeting so we can track of who is here. So if everybody can make sure they sign up. If you wish to speak for public comment, there's also a sign-up sheet for that. And I know I just looking over there, there might be a little confusion about which sheet to sign up on. So if you're here for the, the, the Oxbow, Newbury, um, U32, Barnard, Huntington, or Orwell, that public to be heard is at 11.30, so make sure you sign up for that public to, uh, to be heard. So making sure everybody gets time for their voice. So we, um, we're coming back for Barnard, and we have John, who has the time. Um, so if you want to just introduce yourself for the record, and we can get started. Um, I'm Pamela Fraser. I am on the Windsor Central Modified Unified Union School Board and uh, for Barnard 7 through 12, and uh, am a member of the Alternative Governance Structure Committee and Barnard Academy. I'm Corinne Park, the chair of the Barnard School District School Board, and a member of that. Team. So we have um, some clear comments to take about 10, 10, 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, Consolidation can be a good idea if a school cannot afford programming, has negative outcomes, and or is too expensive, like we saw this morning, with positive outcomes. This is not the case, though, with our school. Barnard is meeting, and in some cases, exceeding the five goals of Act 46. We meet the state educational quality standards, have academic outcomes above state averages, have per pupil cost in line with the state average and amongst the lowest in ISU, and highly significant to our proposal, our enrollment is growing. While the Secretary's plan uses the concept of volatile enrollment as justification, a justification for recommending merger for Barnard, actual data shows steady and dramatic growth over the past five years, with enrollment growing from 62 to 81 and currently 83 for this coming year. We meet the goals for having high levels of operational efficiency, transparency, accountability, fiscal responsible budgets, and we have a long history of shared resources in our SU. Our principal, Hannah Tyne, was recently named Elementary Curriculum Coordinator across the SU, reflecting another strength that we bring to the SU and the level of cooperation. Beyond these quantitative achievements, our proposal also assumes your capacity to appreciate a concept of education that encompasses the value of relationships and community to student experience. It is difficult to make a qualitative argument with parties that are tuned only to quantitative ones, those who only discuss education as fungible, as a product, a deliverable. But many sophisticated educators and policymakers understand the significant positive impact of strong interpersonal ties and of individual attention on behalf of Barnard Academy. 
The recommended merger decreases our ability to meet and exceed the goals. Merger will force us into a relationship with those who have already codified their plans to diminish our successful school and continue to demonstrate unwillingness to compromise. With merger, quality and equity for our students will be reduced. Firstly, I'd like to talk about two ways. Firstly, our preeminent four stars pre-K program would be at risk for reduction. The MUD voted, the Windsor Central MUD voted in April of this year to begin offering pu public pre-K in its member elementary schools only to the degree that it is cost neutral. Thus, with this unanimous vote, the Unified District has made a decision incompatible with our more extensive 35 hour per week pro programming for three and four year olds. To maintain parity, we will have to cut back a program that offers optimum equity of opportunity, opportunity which advances future learning capacities and which closes the achievement gap for economically disadvantaged students. Our two board members, votes to invest in pre-K to where we are on that board would have no impact on the 16 votes against monetary investment in pre-K. Secondly, Windsor Central MUD Article 15 authorizes the removal of two grades from our school despite a very weak rationale for the choice of our school. Not only would this render us unsustainable, but forcing some but not all students in a unified district to bus to elementary school and therefore to have two school transitions in two years is an inequitable burden that solves no problem. Our students face no opportunity gap, and we already share significant resources and work together in many ways, ways that do not threaten our campus. The Secretary's plan contains misleading data and information about our school. The AOE sourced ADM data in our proposal shows undeniable significant growth, which I mentioned in enrollment, but in ADM, over five years, the ADM has grown from 60 in 2014 to 76 in 2018. That's a growth rate of 26.67%. The only dip in growth over that period is a 2.1 ADM decrease one year. Oddly, even though ADM is defined on the AOE website as including pre-K and published ADM numbers include a pre-K ratio, the Secretary's plan uses a new calculus removing pre-K to assert a different lower and more volatile ADM. This calculation combined with selective attention to two years leads the Secretary's plan to misleadingly assert that our enrollment has, quote, fluctuated dramatically over the last five fiscal years, end quote. The Secretary's plan appears to have chosen a single year's decrease and subsequent return to steady growth out of context to create a narrative of volatility. And then the plan goes on to assert that enrollment volatility can lead to tax volatility. Though this may be true, it is irrelevant because our enrollment and our tax rates have been, our enrollment has been steadily growing and our tax rates have been steady. Secretary plan also downplays the significance of Article 15, which I already mentioned, which requires the restructuring of elementary school configurations and recommends the removal of fifth and sixth grades from our school. This article is likely the single biggest reason that our electorate voted no on merger. And we find it to epitomize the Unified Board's continued unwillingness to create a new definition of us that recognizes Barnett's strengths and offers equal powers and protections for member districts. This leads us to two last points today. The Secretary's recommended merger encourages closure and leaves us no access to the increased fairness of the draft default articles of agreement mentioned at the last SBE meeting in Newark. The loss of our school after four years is not a mere theoretical concern but a reasonable foreseeable consequence of this recommended merger. In addition to Article 15, the current MUD article of school closure offers us little protection against the whim of our neighbors. So we understand that your board will not close our school. It will be a local decision, but it is a highly predictable local decision um, that we believe that the merger will not only encourage closure, but will actually create the conditions for closure. Ironically, the AOE now seems to recognize that there are vulnerabilities for small schools in merger agreements are, like ours with these drafted uh, default articles of agreement that you will vote on or have voted on. I'm not sure where you are in that process. We applaud the AOE for recognizing the validity of such concerns, such as protections for small districts regarding school closure and reconfiguration of school grades and buildings and imbalanced board representation. However, because we'd be forced into an already operational unified district, we would have no access to these articles. 
because Marit electorates previously voted on different articles, and those votes will be honored, not community sentiment. If your board concurs with the AOE and approves the recommended or has approved the recommended default articles, then your board should not vote to merge any NMED into a unified district who don't have access to those more fair-minded articles. As you know, according to the law, your board must not judge Section 9 proposals more stringently than you judge Section 5 plans. Your obligation is to uphold the law and not the AOE's recommendation. There's ample evidence that legislative intent, intent was to allow alternative structures for school districts like ours that meet and exceed the goals. Thank you. Just a couple more minutes. Uh, Pamela and I and, and many other committed representatives of our town have spent literally hundreds of volunteer hours researching merger possibilities, sitting on committees, exploring relationships, and finally writing our proposal on how Barnard will continue to meet the goals of Act 46 in a way that respects and secures Barnard's strengths and values as a community. We've shown why the theoretical benefits of a larger government structure would not actually benefit our school district on the whole, but rather reduce educational opportunities for our kids. But in addition to providing these evidence-based arguments, we'd also like to bring something important into sharp focus. We, and many others in this room, asking to be heard today, are often accused of being too emotional about this issue, perhaps too insular, focusing only on our students instead of all students in a region. But it's both reasonable and important to feel passionate about the threat involved here and to feel protective of what we have. This forced merger will damage a school and a community that is currently thriving. Our small communities are held together by values that will be slowly eroded as the school is extricated from its heart, whether slowly or quickly. Values having to do with mutual respect and support, a face-to-face -face kindness to neighbors, service, and gratitude. The school is the heart of the community. It's where we come together in support of our children. It's where we show one another that we care across generations, across economic, political, and social divides. By forcing consolidation, you take away the opportunity for us to care for each other in a very fundamental and intimate way, and our community loses its heart. Our children grow up without those community roots so necessary in today's world. Has Vermont stopped caring about values other than efficiency? I hope not. It's vital to recognize that your decision is about something more than numbers. It will show how much we've lost as a state if we've stopped listening to the communities who really care. If we're not listening to each other, especially when we care very deeply, we have lost the heart of Vermont. Thank you for hearing our comments today. So I just want to pick up on the on your comment about educational quality and, and that you're um, dealing with the proposal that, that what you offer today in terms of your program meets all of the, the goals in terms of quality and equity. And, and you, you mentioned sort of the, the concern um, that if you do move into a merged governance structure that there's a possibility that, um, that the school might become pre-K through through second grade and the, the, the older grades um, students will go somewhere else. My question is, um, when you were speaking about you know, the opportunities that you have available today, how, how, do, how do they compare with what's been proposed for this, these other structures? Do you, are you looking at a, um, a reduction in opportunity if you move to that type of structure or, or equivalent? Yeah. Uh, I, I think that my um, almost year now on the modified unified district board gives me a, a great deal of perspective about not just what the 706 that came up with, but how that's being interpreted this year and will continue to be interpreted. And I think that um, the, the 706B committee's plan, which uh, first was pre-K through two uh, at Barnard and one other school, um, then through a lot of community pushback became pre-K to four, so just removing two grades um, the original rationale for that um, group, which would reduce um, two schools, two teachers overall, um, was to use the money that was saved by those two teacher positions to increase uh, what we call specials, um, teaching and equalize them. Um, but the plan was considered 
ill-conceived after the fact because it was determined that there actually wasn't any room in the curriculum to increase specials and that there really wasn't any, um, a big enough difference between uh, programming at the different schools. So um, I think it's interesting to note that the original rationale for the plan has been discarded. Um, now it's more of an idea um, among unified board members of that's still a good idea because we can use the money for something, basically. But there's no concrete plan. Sorry about it. Sorry, I'm not there. Oh, sorry. Um, you, you spoke about almost the inevitability of the school being closed. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. we've seen numerous examples of this in articles of agreement whereby the community has the ultimate decision in closing the school. It has that, is that not taking root in terms of your? Um, well, I think, um, you know, so when we've, we've seen many proposals come before us when they wrote the articles of agreement themselves. And so in, in those articles of agreement that people have written themselves, they've chosen to put in those right. protections, so they're very different around the state. And I, I know it was mentioned though in New York, we are waiting on the draft articles of agreement from the AOE. And because um, we need Secretary One to allow the Secretary to review them before it, they came out, but they should be coming soon. They've gone through the Secretary of State's office and they've gone back to the AOE for drafting and are it, it, within the AOE right now looking for those protections. So I, I think what here, if you're asking, but I mean, the real fear is then you brought up if the draft articles of agreement, which ones would you be using? And I think those are good arguments. And if you are then put in with another group that already has a different set of draft articles. So what you're looking for is protection to make sure that your school is, is not at the end of a larger tour, correct? And, and, and I mean, the bigger question for I think this board is which draft articles of agreement would be used in this circumstance? Correct. And I, and I would say the, the articles of agreement that the, the modified unified board is, they're, they're currently operating operating under them, right? So they're not they're not just in a, they're not just a draft stage yet they sort of right. voted on, right? So there's a And I'm not sure what those are. So if you could tell us what they yeah, are. Yeah. So and, and this is one of the things that maybe you can speak more to this, but that we have um, in various at uh, several different points throughout this past year since our since our district had voted not to join, um, tried to bring to the board saying, you know, these are our biggest concerns. Is there is there room on this new board to reconsider these these articles because they are they perform very little um, afford very little protection for the school. So for um, school closure, it's um, simple majority modified unified board vote and then brought to the electorate, um, but simple majority of the combined electorate. Um, so we've offered a few examples of how these can be strengthened to accommodate, um, sort of uh, address and, and recognize, you know, communities that are going to be most impacted, and they and have gone nowhere with those. Um, that was the main article we were supposed to talk about. And also the the restructuring article of yeah. uh, the board. No, that the board. The board comes, that, that oh, board composition. Oh, the board composition. Uh, we would like to ideally have a conversation with the uh, unified district about the possibility of um, a hybrid model. Um, I don't feel that we're like as, you know, that's a, a, a must do for us, but we would like to have the, the option um, to just even discuss it because during the 706B process, um, many of their members were telling members of the public that the only legal model was proportional and we kept trying to say no look here's an AOE memo that's not true but it just uh, we felt that the, that correct information did not make it around to the public um, but the other uh, third article of agreement that we've been trying to get the um, board and board members to be open to discuss discussing is this article for removing grades from the Barnard School and the Reading School, and as a member of the board, I can report that they are moving forward with the Reading piece. In fact, they voted, although unsuccessfully, to take the sixth grade out this year. Um, there's enormous pushback from members of the Reading community, but it's on the um, slate to be discussed again in September. So, and I can also report to you that after hearing about the default articles of agreement and being sort of 
amazed at the irony that um, we would not have access to those because they're exactly what we have been asking for. I put a motion forward to discuss, just to discuss the possibility of revising articles, some articles of agreement on July 31st at a Winter Central Monday, and that was rejected. So um, it was decided that in December, after the statewide plan comes out, they could discuss what they're going to do with Barnard. So um, I felt that that was a significant statement of where they are. And that's the thing that's important to consider. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, so. um, thanks for those explanations. So I'm always interested in what would it take, or put it another way, what are the one or two obstacles which, if they were addressed and authentically resolved, would um, make it really possible. Uh, what, are, what are the key obstacles that, if addressed, would make it possible? Or is it just not possible? I, I, um, I think for our town, our electorate, the, the, the main our obstacle, which was a, a, a very real art obstacle, were these articles of agreement. Okay. That, so this, this particular merger and the, um, so if there were a way to address those, um, you know, we would be open to discuss, you know, coming back to the table. Um, that being said, there is a large, um, you know, there are many of us that also believe that um, as we sort of outline our proposal, the benefits of merging don't necessarily even even beyond that. Even if even if the, <coughs> the threat of school closure is not as great, the benefits of merging may not may still not be worth. Um, giving up that local school board. And and it's because of many of the reasons you've heard, you know, this morning and, and other, other times in this room. There is a value to sort of the community's real engagement in the school in these small towns. Um, and that's a value that I think is it's hard to put, you know, put your finger on, pin down, quantify, um, but it is very, very real for these rural towns. It's a reason why my family moved to Barnard. It's a reason why many of the town family moved to Barnard, many of the new families who have come to our town and um, you know, impacted the enrollment at our school have come to this particular community because it is one um, that has this kind of engagement. And you know, that's not to say we can, we can foresee exactly what things are gonna look like should um, should this shift change? But we do know what a strong rural community looks like now, and we do know that the, start, the, the school and that engagement in the school is, a, is the heart of it. And we do know that engagement in, and we've heard it even from merge boards here, engagement in the school processes, engagement in um, you know, education and sort of the, the care for, for the children of the town when the management of, of the school goes elsewhere, that really declines. You know, it, it's much harder for people to, to be involved, to be at the board meetings, to, to feel that they are empowered to impact what's going on at their school and with their, with their children. So I think those are still obstacles to a merger, especially when you're looking at, I mean, if we're looking at um, a merge board and merger partners, who share those kinds of values and who respect those kinds of values, I think our townspeople might be more comfortable with, with entering into a merger. Um, but for example, right now, um, those kinds of values um, are, and, and really our, our town and our school are, are being really overlooked and, and disparaged with sort of a blind, a blind eye. So, um, I would encourage you to submit anything, as you said, you're still working on boards and if anything develops between now and the fall. Again, we're not discussing in October, so if any information comes for our future, you can submit it to us. Thank you. Thank you.
services um, from Chittenden East. We have no issues with special ed and transportation whatsoever. We have an issue with administration because we believe in charging us uh, excessively um, for the services that the board uh, receives. Innovative programs at Brewster Pierce, um, which we would hope would never change. We're not suggesting they would under a merger. We want to make darn sure they don't, they don't change. Um, we have a locally sourced food program for our school cafeteria. We have an outdoor classroom that was constructed totally, 100% local, local funds, community did that for us. We have a Forest Fridays program, uh, which now applies to our entire school through the Audemont Center, which is located just a couple miles south of, of Bruce Pierce. The bottom line is, and I've been in education for my entire life, the bottom line is, we're talking about children's behaviors here. We're talking about their cognitive, their emotional, their social, their physical behaviors. That's not going to change with merger. There is no way that a merger is going to help us with cognitive, emotional, social, and physical behaviors. It is not going to change Huntington in terms of special ed. It is not going to change Huntington in terms of transportation. The only possible benefit for merger has to do with efficiencies, administrative efficiencies. Um, and again, we have this argument, and I'm not going to go into it now. If there are questions, I'm glad to respond to them around um, how we're being charged for uh, administrative services. The land was donated to the school more than 50 years ago. The building was. The funding for the building was bequeathed from the local family. So we start out as being a community school, and many of the other schools that you're, you're hearing from. In 2011, 14, 16, and 18, there were votes in Huntington. And in all four situations, the vote was no on merger. The total vote was 63% no, 37% yes. No question, we're talking about a substantial majority of people in Huntington having been presented all of the information and all of the acts relative to merger, changing language as best we possibly could over the years through uh, community forms. In 2017, we had a debate starting in September about whether to warn a fourth vote, whether we should take a position on merger. The board has never taken a position on merger or a con, We've given it to the community. Yes, these are the benefits, these are the negatives, as best we possibly could. Um, and on a split vote, four to one, we decided to warn a fourth vote. And the reason that one person didn't vote for it was because she felt that, that the community didn't want to come back yet another time to deliver the same message. No, Huntington doesn't want to vote. We did warn the vote, the vote was 60% no, and vote um, 40% yes. Now, where are we today? Well, in terms of the report from the um, AOE, it was, and it was a, it was a good solid report, and it was quite factual. With one, with one totally overstating having to do with property taxes, we benefited from the re reduction in property taxes because of the we're part of the larger district. So the middle school and the, and the high school 
we received a proportional reduction, but we didn't receive the entire um, reduction. There are outstanding issues, and I believe this applies to every school that you're hearing from last month, today, and next month. Every school, and I just heard it from Farmer. We have two particular issues. One has to do with voting, and one has to do with articles of agreement. The voting. It is not clear to me that there is language anywhere that supports a forced merger without a local community vote for that merger. So we don't know if there's going to be a vote. We're sitting here in August. We don't know whether there's going to be a vote in November or a vote in March. We don't know whether Huntington would have to vote for that merger. I have to assume they won't. They voted for it four times no. A fifth no would probably be what would occur statistically. Um, and what would happen if the other towns vote no? So we don't know if there's going to be a vote. We don't know how that all works. Um, and then as to articles of agreement, do we have to have articles of agreement on which to vote? And one would assume we shouldn't vote until we have articles of agreement. We don't have articles of agreement. We, not even school board. There are those who argue that the existing articles of agreement, which were in effect for the modified union, do not apply to us. That's been an argument that's been made. So my response was, well, then what does apply? And the response was, this is probably going to get, end up going to court. Now, something that we don't want, but something we're very prepared to do, not with taxpayer money, if we have to, to argue about this. What are the, what's the hang up on articles of agreement? What do I think is going to happen? Two, one is the property, <coughs> and the second is debt, or debt. Now, the current articles of agreement that are in effect with the modified union have had all of those towns, Baltimore, Richmond, Jericho, Underhill, all of their debt from those five elementary schools was absorbed into the larger modified union. It was all picked up 100%. There's been an argument that we cannot assume that our debt would necessarily be picked up by the modified union. Well. That's simply a non-starter for us. Absolutely a non-starter that all of our debt wouldn't be picked up just like it was for the other towns. The other question has to do with our property, which was donated to the to the town for the use of the school more than 50 years ago. What happens to that acreage? How do we do that conveyance? Um, would we be expected to convey the entire um, property, or could Huntington keep part of that property, et cetera? And that's just two of two of the issues, but probably those are the two most um, salient issues. We don't have articles of agreement that we can vote on. We would argue there has to be articles of agreement in place before there's a vote. We would argue there has to be a vote in Huntington and in the receiving um, district. There is no way that your board is going to be able to make a recommendation on Huntington in time for a November vote. It's simply not going to happen. And I don't know how it would happen in any town unless, unless the towns are going to warrant a contingent vote, which says something like, if the state board says X, we'll do Y. Um, and that's going to present a real problem to us. So we need articles of agreement if there is going to be a merger. We don't need articles of agreement if there's not going to be a merger. We don't know when to start to retain an attorney if we have to do that to develop articles of agreement? Should we wait until your recommendation is on the table to be able to do that? I think it's quite likely that we do not make an FY20 date on this. I simply don't see it. Because if there's not a November vote, the budgets are already in place. We would have already put our budget in place for FY20. So we've got logistical concerns. So we're not in favor of the recommendation. We believe we're meeting the acts of goal of, uh, we believe we're meeting the goals of Act 46, just fine the way they are right now. And thank you very much for listening. Do we have time for a question? Sorry. All right, so first question. John Yes, about the debt. Um, say on a 
per capita basis? Is your debt burden significantly different than those of the neighboring communities whose uh, debt was absorbed? Yes. In which direction? Our debt per capita is higher than the debt in the in the other in the other towns. By an order of magnitude? I uh, perhaps two to one. Uh, maybe a little less than that. Maybe one and a half to one. We the um, this quickly. Huntington and our board supported an HVAC, geothermal HVAC system, $1.25 million. Installed that last year. That's a classic example of a decision Huntington made that the larger board probably would not have. They would have gone, they would have gone with a with an oil-based or a wood chip based system, most likely an oil-based system, and saved about five hundred thousand dollars. But our town is very green and was very interested in the geothermal. So we've got about 1.25 million on the books from, from last year to 30 year bond. And we've got, I think, a couple others that you know, were for that in tune of about two or two and a half million dollars. So that, and that's a significant question because if you're in the other towns, are you going to vote to accept Huntington when you know they're accepted? Because we're going to say they should have accepted our debt when our debt per capita is more than their debt. But we think they should because when the Mount Mansfield Modified Union was put into place, there was lots of inequities in terms of debt. The Richmond debt was very high. It was very high relative to some of the other towns. But what they did is they just brought it all in, and that was it. Day, day was over. And Richmond didn't pay any more or any less than the other town. Could you just talk to me? Uh, I, I received a public comment. One of them was a parent from Huntington that talked about how others within the SU right now within the mud have intra-district intra choice. And that was something they were interested in but not available to them in Huntington. Um, and because of the, some needs of their student, they would prefer if they could go to a different school um, within, within the district. Um, so is there any movement on the board to allow intra-district um, crossing of students? Because you're in a peculiar position where you're in a mud where everybody else is under some rules and then your students enter with them in middle school. So for that early part, how are you working with the MUD to create those opportunities for students in Huntington that need them? Um, good question. I think mean, choice is a good question and I think uh, uh, movement of, of teachers is another good question as a layoff. Um, in terms of the um, choice, what happens is the family comes to the board and the board makes a decision, the family makes a petition to the superintendent's office. And it comes to the board and the board makes a decision. Are we gonna pay roughly $15,000 for that student to go to that other school in our district this coming year? I've been on the board since 2014. We've not turned down a family. Now that's a tough one for us, right? That's a lot of money. But if you think about it, from a financial point of view, it's cost us about $15,000 to educate a student between 15 and 16. And it costs the Mount Mansfield District about fifteen to 16000 to educate that student. So whether that student's going to Huntington or whether that student's going to Jericho, somebody's paying for it. Right? So we have, in fact, supported that. Now, would we necessarily support every family's petition? Um, no. Because right now we're doing on an individual by individual case. And I can imagine a situation where the justification is not a solid justification. Where we merge, then choice is in play, automatically in play. But right now, it's discretionary on part of the board. Yeah. Um, so two, two questions. Uh, first is, just looking at your some of your statistics, particularly around enrollment at ADM and, and your costs, and your ADM has gone, your enrollment has gone down sequentially over a number of years, and your costs are going up. So if you were to merge into a district, you plus moving that debt into the district, it, it would seem to be there would seem to be pretty significant financial advantages to the taxpayers in your district. I'm very curious if you've modeled any of that out. Um, we have in the um, first of all the the ADM calculation. I have to say is a strange calculation. I was when I worked in Massachusetts. I worked in Connecticut, and now in Vermont, we've got this thing called ADM. I look at headcount, I look at how many students we have in school, because that's how we're teaching. Right? When the principal sets up the number of classes that we need, the number of teachers we need, it's not based on ADM, 
It's based on how many little children we have, how many preschoolers we have, how many grade one to grade four. If you look at enrollment for us, and you and you can somehow get past the, and Barnard talked about it, the incredibly um, confusing calculations resulting from preschoolers, right, a couple of years ago, where our numbers were crazy, they were up and down, the same number of kids, but they were up and down. Um, we are slightly more expensive. We are slightly more expensive, right, than um, Bolton and Richmond Under Hill here elementary schools. Yes, we are, but not by much. Our town budget, our town approved the budget this coming year, 0.29% increase. 0.29% increase for Bruce and Pierce. And if there's any way that we can save money during the year, we will do that. Um, if we need to get an attorney because of all of this, we won't do it out of taxpayer dollars. We will get people, will donate the money. They, they feel that strongly about it. So anytime we can go to non-taxpayer dollars, we will, we will do that. But in terms of the overall financial efficiency, when you're on your computer and you're on your spreadsheet and do the calculation, yes. On a per pupil basis, we are a little more expensive than the rest of the district. And from a taxpayer point of view, it would be slightly better off, okay? They know that. They absolutely know that in Huntington. They know they're paying for a quality school. They're willing to pay a little bit more. And I'm talking a little bit more, not a lot more. And every time we've gone to the voters, they've said, no, 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 and no. We know it's gonna cost a little bit more if we don't merge. We don't want to merge. We're willing to pay a little bit more. And that hasn't changed a lot of So I just move on to my second question. I just want to pick up on your comment about the uh, about the, the boiler, and I'm having a hard time rationalizing that decision, and it sounds like, if I heard you correctly, a $500,000 premium over a wood chip boiler. Over a boiler, yeah. How does, it, it doesn't comport, that, I guess it doesn't really comport with the goals of Act 46, particularly around providing greater opportunities for students, so I'm, I guess what I'm trying to understand is the how you think the argument you're making for retaining this this control over these types of decisions actually furthers the goals of Act 46 around the issues of equity and educational quality. Um, if you had been in our school prior to the installation of our HVAC system, right, you would know why we had to do it the way we did it. Um, the ventilation units on the floor were so old the mechanicals all had to be replaced. Okay, that's where we started. So everything had to be gutted. We did not want to go with oil, and there were a large percentage of people in the community who did not want to go with oil, nor did they want to go with wood chips for a variety of reasons. And we really thought that geothermal was the way to go. 100 years, these wells will be in existence. 100 years. You can't say that with any other system, okay? The electric system that we have, those units, are good for, those units are good for 20 years, so we are good to go. The community voted for the HVAC system 80% to 20, 85% I think to 15%. They knew it was gonna cost them more, to about $50,000 um, a year more. They knew that. And they knew, they knew that they were gonna end up paying in their property taxes. Um, in terms of Act 46, we don't believe that the murder would per se, the merger per se, is going to increase the ability of Huntington's being having more quality, more equity, et cetera. We just don't we just don't believe that. But the HVAC system decision was a decision made based on what the people in the community felt was best. We have a dehumidification as part of if you know geothermal, right? It comes with automatic dehumidification. People in town can use Brewster Pierce for the first time if they want in the summertime and you're not gonna walk in even if it's 80, 80, 85 degrees and 100% humidity outside, you're gonna say, this is really nice here. We never had that before. So students are in a building now for the first time in 20 years where they can be educated properly because they have the right HVAC system. We would not have had air conditioning with, the, um, with oil or with wood. And it comes off of the top of the uh, of the geothermal, we're not paying anything for air. So we only have about a minute left, Peter. But, um, 
you were the first MUD participant as a result of, I think it was 2012's Act 156. Um, you kept your local board, you had representation on the supervisory board, but you did not have any representation on the union board that was formed. Um, how, how, is, how, is, how has it impacted your, your district? And, and are you content with the way, the way it's been set up? Um, I, I, I believe you were in favor of that. Of that of that bill, and uh, I'm wondering how, how that's all impacted you. Well, about 30 seconds. And there were yeah. there were uh, there were two towns who voted against merger, Richmond and and Huntington. In 14, Richmond voted for merger. That left Huntington as the. We have. I sit on the board. I sit on the Mount Mansfield board to listen, but not to vote. And they do the shit. And East has a board. The Mount Mansfield has a board at the same time. Some of the issues are, are in the east. I'm able to vote on those. I have two thirds of a. I have two thirds of a vote. The way it's set up now works fine. Um, I'm on the collective bargaining committee. I'm also on the finance committee. We had somebody on the policy committee. We had somebody on the assessment committee. None of that would change. So the way it's set up now is fine. What's going to happen is if we merge. Huntington will not necessarily have a representative on collective bargaining. Huntington will not represent necessarily have a representative on the finance committee. That is really bad. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in and for participating. Thank you. Um, we have Orwell come up and join us. So the last question from Orwell. <coughs> Well, regardless of how against the merger, 
But either way, I feel that the town doesn't want to be in the merger. So I, I feel that the town shouldn't be in the merger. I, I don't feel that there's any um, real benefit to the merger. We're already doing almost everything Act 46 says. You know, we share resources. We're doing curriculum. That's all the same. We have curriculum coordinator. Um, and I just, we just don't see the benefits of actually merging whether the, as it's staying the, the way we are right now. Uh, so I am I am one of the the three board members that is in favor of the merger. <coughs> I chaired the second study committee. And my, my main feelings and I, I understand where the town's coming from. But my first goal, having just had two students go through the school system, was that um, I felt that there would be better educational opportunities for students under a merge system. Um, that was my, my major feeling. When I looked at this and the way Act 46 spelled out, I agree with you. We are sharing research sources very well. We, um, we work together well as a district, as a union. Unlike some people, I don't fear that our school is going to be closed with a merger. I think that in the second go round, we addressed many of the concerns that the town had. Um, the first merger proposal called for proportional voting. The second proposal is a hybrid. Every town has the same say. We really try to tighten up the whole issues of school closure, so it does come back to the town and it requires more than a simple majority. Uh, in looking at things, as a, as a parent, both of my children, when they arrived at the high school, kids were arriving in ninth grade at different levels. And I'm hearing now that that may not be the case, but at that time, it was the case, and that was a that was a major concern for me. And you know, the other thing is, we are not our community. There are not a lot of in-town jobs. Many people have to leave the community for work. Um, in looking at the financial things, the way Act Forty Six is set up, I mean, we're starting to feel the pinch now. We're looking at a fifteen cent increase in our educational property tax rate for next year. On our voter approved budget, it was not an exact, it was not an extravagant budget. It was a level services budget. We did not add anything, but when you start having the other factors that cascade down, um, and I don't know how long our community will continue to support the school if we're going to have large tax increases like that at the level of the that we're having. The loss, potential loss of the small school grant is significant. That's about five cents on our tax rate. So, and we all know the salaries and everything aren't going up. So that played into my my thinking. I understand where the people are coming from. Nobody likes the idea of being told what to do. But when I when I weighed all the options, that was why I supported this. So um, the first study committee that we had, I was the chair of the study committee and uh, had stepped back to allow a member of the public to be on the second study committee. I uh, thought it'd be a better choice to have public input as well. Uh, my position has not changed as a board member. Um, at the time that Act 46 was passed, I sat in the legislature and I did not support Act 46 from the perspective of uh, saving money, taxpayers. Um, so, so for myself, um, you know, coming from a perspective of not supporting and then being the chair of that study committee, really trying to be open and see, uh, you know, all perspectives. It took me a while to get to the place where I uh, did support Act 46. I think for myself, the equity piece uh, made, you know, me whole. Um, again, as a board member, I try to represent all children. Uh, I had twin boys that did go through the school system, and we had some unfortunate situations with ill teachers, and it was 
two and a half years out of uh, three years of education that really was not quality education. And I felt as you know, a bigger district, we may have the opportunity to have some full-time uh, licensed staff that we could prioritize towards area needs, and uh, that, that seems significant to me. Also, uh, we share a lot of resources with our neighbor town, Benson. We uh, share positions such as uh, our teachers, phys ed, nurse, uh, and, and my concern was that as we saw those other schools uh, merge and work as a unit, that uh, potentially, you know, years down the road, we may be on an island that uh, perhaps they, you know, we have a great relationship today, but um, I guess, you know, part of it was fear on my side that if they chose to work with a unified union and we lost those shared positions, uh, that would be very difficult for us to be able to staff those positions. Um, so, you know, I understand where the town is coming from. This is actually really divided our town on many levels. Our school board members have not been the most pleasurable. I would like to concentrate on education and what's being offered at our school board meetings, and I can uh, count on, you know, one hand how many school board meetings we've had where we've talked about the education that's happening. It's mostly been about, um, you know, the situation and what we're tasked with here at hand. Um, so again, town is divided. Our board was 3-2 in support. That didn't come easily. It was an hour and a half of conversation at our last meeting uh, in preparation for this. Um, I appreciate what you all have done, and I think we're in a difficult position here with where our town stands as well. So the, um, my colleague asked a question before, and I don't think we really heard a, a clear answer. What, what, where is the opposition? Uh, and, I, and I heard there was a response to some opposition around school closure and voting that was resolved in the second study committee, um, but that was voted down again. So what is the, what else is, I guess, what, where is the, the opposition coming from if those issues were resolved? Um, a lot of it's just the town control of the school and being able to run Orwell as Orwell wants to run. You know, we wouldn't have our school board there at the Orwell anymore. You'd be a three-person people on a 18-person board. And it, that's, that's the biggest issue, that there's no gain in this for Orwell and Orwell stu students, from what I can see. So it's, it's a lot of it's just local control and running the school the way we want to run our school, not the way all the other towns want to run the school with us. It's just I think it makes it harder for people to um, like come to your school board meeting and talk about issues that you have. You can talk about with five people that you know or 18 people you don't know. <coughs> Question. I was having the same question. Why? Because you folks have a reputation for having a good school and a good supervisory union. Things work well because centralized services. And I begin. I'm asking myself, what difference would it really make in terms of how you're operating? Well, that's part of the problem. We 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 have all that. So what do we gain by going that? by consolidating with the Slate Valley. Right now we're doing all that and we're having good results. We do send students down to Fairhaven um, that are doing good. We have one kid in a second in his class right now. Um, I have a son that just went through and he's doing fine. He just went down and started last year. I have two other kids in school and they're doing good. I don't see that merging is gonna improve any of that. You're still going to have separate schools. We still have the curriculum coordinator, but you're still going to have differences from school to school, student to student. That would be the case if you had one school or ten schools, because that's the way students are, and we just don't see any benefit other than we don't have as much control of our school as we do now. I think the control is the big piece uh, for the town's people. Uh, I go back to when we worked on our transportation merger and that was very difficult. Uh, we've been doing it for years now and I look back and we have an opportunity where we have a ski program at the school and if we hadn't have merged our transportation it would have been difficult to do the ski program because we have two buses up at Killington at the same time we're dispatching kids in Orwell and so that has actually provided 
more opportunity for us. But I think it's hard, you know, to see the opportunity. There's a lot of concern out there as to our seventh and eighth graders moving down to Fairhaven and speculation of what that would do to the school and the population and would that mean less kids in Orwell and if we have declining population, would that mean the school closes? And so, um, you know, I, I can definitely see the piece of wanting to have local control and being able to make those decisions. Um, I do understand that if seventh and eighth grade did go down, and there's concern, it's parents and transportation, and that's uh, more time spent going 15 miles in another direction. John? Did, I don't know if you were here for the Addison Central presentation earlier. <coughs> Many of their communities had a concern about loss of local control. Um, and um, they've gone ahead with a, with a consolidation. And the going hasn't been easy. But the results have been pretty promising in terms of the opportunity for students and the improvement of the, of the sending schools to be arriving at high school or middle school more or less on the same page and the same readiness. One of the, one of the takeaways from that presentation was that the burden, the, the hard work falls on the adults, the hard work of adapting to change, uh, giving up what feels like control, and the benefits accrue to students. And um, it's maybe useful to remember that, what we all know, that we bring very different perspectives to this. You bring a very real perspective of the community of Orwell. And <clears throat> in particular, the perspective of adults in Orwell. Um, and the board brings a different perspective, which is our mandate is to look after the education of 76,000 children in the state and to be attentive to the constitutional and legal obligations that the state works under, which among other things means that uh, children should have all opportunities, uh, or children shouldn't be the victims of where they happen to live. Uh, and to the extent that children can move across boundaries, to that extent we can enhance equity and opportunity for kids. And certainly that's been the experience already of some of the communities that have consolidated. So I think there's some things to be learned from the positive experiences of those who have combined. That many of the things that people were very, very afraid of have not materialized largely because of very good agreements in advance. Um, and that, that in many cases there's a payoff as you were describing. You both can see the benefits of students and you can see very clearly the concerns of the, the actors and adults. So can I have a question to, to yes. <laughs> Jane? Yes. Um, you mentioned that the school has been closed for several years. Um, and I know that there's been a lot of discussion about that. Um, and I know that the have you been able to increase opportunities or have you gone to meetings and you're going, we're cutting art, we're cutting music, we have to cut this program. So just with your current, in the last five to 10 years, have you been able to add opportunities or have you been sitting around the table and figuring out which ones do you part away? Yeah, so since I've been on the board uh, for <coughs> eight years, uh, we have not had to cut. Uh, our town is very supportive of what is in the budget Though I would say we're probably pretty conservative about what we ask for as well. Uh, we've been challenged to put on additional higher opportunities. Uh, you know, we meet the needs of those children that are on IEPs, but the ones that are excelling, uh, we've had members come to us asking us to challenge those children. Um, we don't have the numbers necessarily to accommodate for another teacher, but that's not to say the town wouldn't support it if we put it in our town. It's extremely supportive of what we ask. And we, I've only been on the board in four years now. Um, we, we did add the ski program, which is quite expensive. And as you said, you added that opportunity. We have certainly have added opportunities. We have not cut opportunities for our students. There are more opportunities that I personally would like to see added. I, mean, I think that 
our upper students, we really need to get start adding stuff along the lines of the STEM program because as everything becomes globalized and our entire world is changing, that's going to be a very significant demand for our, of our future students. Um, and that's not going to come cheap. Would our community support it? Yes. Um, it may be a financial hardship for some. It may not be for others. But, I mean, ultimately it's the children that have to be the first part of it. John? Go ahead, Sarah. Oh. I just gave you a shot. You look at me and I said, well, that's something you're supporting. Oh, please, <laughs> again. Other? Stacey? Um, I think Peter, I think you said, if I got the words correctly, looking at the difference between being part of the smaller, uh, a small board or being part of a mud board, I think you said it's a matter of five people that you know versus 18 people you don't know, right? And I'm struck by that because I think that's exactly, well, you don't know them, but you don't know them yet. And I'm wondering if you could comment on um, the folks from Barnard spoke a lot about what the, uh, uh, how things felt on that larger board, and so I guess I'm wondering if there are specific examples of mistrust or conversations that haven't happened, or is it just the fear that you don't know them yet? No, nothing's happened like mistrust or fear of, or anything. I'm just, I mean, we're, we're in Orwell, and so you have a board meeting that's in Fairhaven, and it makes it a lot harder for people to go to Fairhaven to, to meet the meeting, and then you are of your safety, yes. You, you will get to know them to a certain extent, but they are, a, a, you know, unless you work in Castleton or you work in Fair Haven, you're down that way a lot. Or you have a kid in high school, you don't get to know these people as, as easily as you do the people that you're in the community. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing to know people outside the community. I'm just, you know, I just, I think it would be harder for the community to be involved the way they can be now. That's one thing that our community likes. They're involved in our school. They like to be involved in our school. And I just, I feel like there's still opportunities that we can do, and there's opportunities we can do through being in a mud like we are now. We can still share, and you know, we have a good, great working relationship with it. We always have. I don't see why that would go away. You know, you have a superintendent that's great, and you know, she wants to keep things going smooth no matter which way we go. Um, so that's. Basically what I was saying. Thank you. And um, when you said just four years, I mean, anybody on board, just thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, it's never, it's like 22 years. <laughs> All right, so um, we are, OK. Um, so what we have now is half an hour for public comment on the proposals that we've heard from first. Um, I'm going to go through first and people from those accounts just to make sure we get to them. Um, we have another set after lunch and another time for public to be heard for those. Um, we also then have another set after that, another public to be heard, and then a general public to be heard. So um, I know there's a lot of people who want to speak, you want to hear everybody. So we are going to do two minutes per person and we're going to try to get through. What I'm gonna ask is that we have the first person and then um, we'll have the second person. Oh, sorry, okay. This is not on my time. No, so um, I'm gonna ask John, we are, again, I know it's hard for two minutes, but if you see our schedule, we're trying to hear from as many boards, as many people as possible. So if you could just, you know, I, I understand this minute, he's gonna flip it over. It's actually helpful. If you go too long, you get this. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It's color coded, it's kind of nice to lose it over when it's 30 seconds, um, just to give you a warning. And just to thank everybody for coming out and just being polite to everybody and listening. Um, I know this is a lot of people taking time off from their day and their work and to come and, and give comment. And if you don't get to say everything you would like to say, please send public comment. I got it at 11 o'clock last night. They were still coming through. Um, so please send those, whatever you don't get to say. So if you want to start. Thank you. My name is Gail Connolly. I'm a citizen of this in Huntington. I'm a retired school administrator also. 
I've, I've been possibly impressed enough. Anyone here has used any athletic or sports, sports analogies to the, today so far? So let me. I'm the least qualified. My mother would not let me play football. My 40 years in school, I play more football and high school football games than everybody in the room. All oh, coaches that are in the winning put this up for the fourth quarter. This means fourth quarter. And Huntington means we voted no four times. So as you drive by Huntington, please imagine all of us holding our four fingers up. Thank you very much. <laughs> My wife has more to say. Bill, will you give it to me for late night? And it's actually very nicely written in handwriting. So for those that like the person, um, very nice. Uh, so Chris, I appreciate that. And we have Susan Clark come up to you for next, and then Hello. My name is Kimberly Jessup, and I serve as the state representative for Middlesex and East Montpelier. I helped organize a letter, which I hope you've all read. It was signed on to by the entire General Assembly delegation representing the towns that comprise the Washington Central Supervisory Union. And the letter recognizes that the proposal, the pro 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 proposal results from considerable and difficult work by community members as required by statute. I attended many of the meetings myself and came away with a deep respect for all the participants. By now, I assume you're familiar with many of the legal, technical, and policy issues pertaining to this proposal. Like the letter signed on to by members of the General Assembly, people found a way through their differences and came together behind this proposal before you. So here we are. At the end of the day, it's my view that we're really left with a fairly fundamental question, and that is, does consent matter? It does, very much, and for two rather different reasons, in my view. The first concerns performance. If the win-win elements of the so-called preferred model are well suited for nearly all, then it shouldn't need to be forced upon communities at the end of a thorough and deliberative process in accordance with statute. That seems like a likely route to underperformance at best and a recipe for potential future failure at worst. And the second reason, and this is what I view as um, really one of values, is ask yourselves, do you seek to stand with communities or do you wish to stand in for them and discard their work product. I ask that you respect both the process and outcome and approve the final proposal. So, Susan, and then we have Richard. Uh, and then uh, Richard uh, from Calais is uh, up next. Thank you. I'm Susan Clark. I live in Middlesex, which is part of Washington Central SU. Um, and I strongly support the WCSU board's unanimous decision not to pursue consolidation. Their decision was based on years of research and discussion and effort. <coughs> our communities have always gotten along well, but with our debt issues, consolidation would create inequity, pitting town against town and neighbor against neighborhood. Professional culture revealed the many sophisticated reasons that our citizens strongly oppose consolidation, and those um, results are on the CSU website. I am very grateful that our boards spared us polarizing campaigns, which inevitably would have ended in failed votes. Vermonters have a healthy tradition and cultural aptitude for self-governance, and as you can hear from today's testimony, this passion isn't going away anytime soon, nor should we wish it away. For centuries, Vermonters' commitment to community has been at the heart of how we make sense of the world. In fact, it's this sense of connection and meaning, of personal efficacy and civic responsibility that we so earnestly want to instill in our high school graduates. Make no mistake, to Vermont communities, forced merger is violence. 
It's violence to the democratic process, to communities, to rural schools, and to students. And as with any act of violence, there will be consequences, lawsuits, sure, but also bitter repercussions that will likely endure for generations. The state board can do so much better. You can embrace our rural communities for their strengths and respect their willingness to partner in framing solutions as they have in their uh, proposals. So I urge the board to respect WCSU's wise and well-founded decision. The last thing we should want is to add to the alienation and anger felt by rural communities. It's not good for anyone, especially for our kids. Thanks. Richard Kane from Callas, school board member. In good faith and with the interests of our children, our communities, our state, our very democracy in mind, our five towns each, you know, each came together to address this issue. Engineers, attorney, assistant attorney generals, prominent lawyers, electronics and carpenter, electronics engineers, carpenters, farmers to discuss, debate, and ultimately and unanimously reject the preferred model that we're talking about imposing down upon our district. The same group developed an alternative model which will be which will better serve our needs after thousands of hours of combined effort to do this. I've been involved with this since the very beginning. And I my background is in planning. I work with Addison County as a senior transportation plan. Consolidation works for some communities. Geographically, it works. I know that all of those communities, and yet still you see towns like Little that are really split by this. It does not work for all communities. There is not a one size fits all. It has been proven in Maine and other states. And if we go down this path, we are going to see the same kind of division that has arisen there. What we need to do is do exactly like Susan said, and is exactly like Kimberly Jessup has said. You have to acknowledge the towns that have gone and done the due diligence. These are intelligent people. They are as intelligent as anyone in the agency of education, who incidentally was generally absent from all of these processes. Very occasionally we would see their presence. And rarely was, was any of the feedback considered, unless it was to use to plug, to basically force them farther into the chute of consolidation. We, as a town callus, will fight this. We will, we will challenge it legally in court, and we will also, we are even considering our own school closure and starting an independent school, too, because we feel very strongly that this is our innovation. focused on students. We've offered, as was discussed earlier, uh, elementary school choice within our district. Uh, we've started to offer a partial foreign language immersion program. Uh, and this year we're going to consider repurposing um, one of our elementary schools. Uh, we have two towns and have three elementary schools. We're focused on students um, and achievement and equity. Um, the supervisory union structure that we're still in uh, is a distraction. Um, it's not a benefit to students. Uh, with multiple districts, Huntington Elementary being separate uh, from the rest of the uh, schools. Uh, they have different priorities. It does not allow for the continuous progress of students. Uh, and it requires uh, maintenance of this complicated governance structure. Um, and there are costs associated with that. Uh, the first year that we kept track, um, the separate governance in Huntington School District cost about $20,000. Last year it was $33,221. 
To best serve our students in Mount Mansfield, we must become a supervisory district. We have an existing board. We have articles of agreement. All we would need uh, with the state board's um, recommendation would be a positive vote from the members of our class. Meanwhile, most of all of last year's preferred merger proposals were waved right through with minimal scrutiny. It's as if the train must consolidate had already left the station and just a little bump, like the section of the state law requiring a fair AGS proposal evaluation was not going to get in its way. I ask you all to be careful and judicious, more careful and more judicious than the Secretary's proposed plan is. Please consider what is really right and what is really fair to the students and the towns these hardworking volunteers will represent. My name is Dan Redondo, I'm from Orwell. Um, I have uh, two kids in Orwell, a sixth grader and an eighth grader, and then I also have a freshman, or actually now a sophomore, in Fairhaven. Uh, I think the, the, it boils down to, for our community, is that we voted three times. And what's critical about that third vote is that it was on a, on a plan that uh, considered us as advisable, which created a mud. That plan was presented to you guys, and you guys approved it. And we voted that down. The schools in the district then formed the MUD, which was an approved plan. And now you are forcing us into, or proposing to force us into a merger with them on a plan that we rejected. Not once, not twice, but three times. If that doesn't sink in, what that is is a destruction of the democratic process and an absolute atrocity towards what people committed in terms of their time and energy into understanding the impacts and the proposed benefits. You asked earlier what were the main concerns. Three of 18 representatives. That is a substantial disadvantage. It is clear to anyone with uh, paying attention to the democratic process that three of 18 puts you at substantial risks for financial uh, and educational cuts or being outvoted for, for other aspects. It's critical that that three of 18 be understood. So what I go back to is, is how we get to this spot and, and the fact is that you guys are, are proposing to ignore our vote. The secretary's proposed plan considered that community sentiment. That is not community sentiment. That is, community sentiment is, is people going to a board and say, hey, can you vote on this amendment? Can you take this position? And then a member of the, of the board saying, you know, I think we're going to vote differently. 
That's kind of the community sentiment. We took three legally binding votes. Is that clear? Thank you. can force Callus to go into consolidation. Everything I've heard says you will. Don't you understand what you're doing to our school? You don't see the consequence. You force us into consolidation. That means the Callus school is closed. Understand that. In your hearts, understand what you're doing to Callus. Thank you. Okay, Sherry, Glenn from Orwell. Is there a Glenn? Okay, good. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I will I speak very quickly, so I have enough to say here. Um, please let me introduce myself. My name is Sherry Young. I am a business owner. I'm a scientist. I'm a mother. I'm a resident of Orwell, and I did run a STEAM program for the TIP students of Orwell. Um, I should add a disclaimer here that I am a Flatlander, but I do have two children who are ninth generation Orwellians. Uh, I love this state. I, but I first cried for an entire year when I first moved to Orwell because it's a very rural area. Until my children started at the community school. I then found a wonderful opportunity for my children in the school. They know their neighbors. They partake in intergenerational opportunities within the school day. I volunteer hundreds of hours of my time, like many other volunteers or which are not paid for. Um, I have found that I have a wonderful opportunity for my children to have a grateful opportunity to grow and fail in a supportive and socioeconomic diverse community. I've been an active member of the Act 46 process, often attending meetings outside of my town, being the only person 30 minutes away, not even no one represented from that town. I did what every good scientist would do once I found out about Act 46. I researched the ever-loving daylights out of it. I called Maine. I spoke with superintendents, principals, teachers, Arkansas, Maine, DC, you name it, I know them. Um, I found with all of my research, I had more and more clear vision that the consolidation of the small community school, my rural children of 10, would be negatively impacted. Um, during the meeting two years ago with many legislators that are in this room, I was assured that what happened in Maine would not happen in Vermont. We're not Vermont. We would never have a big stick. That is not true to this day. As I look at the Maine model, the only way to long-term economic stability means to close community schools, remove rural children from the communities who are nurturing and educating them. Where is the equity for rural children in that? Have you ever ridden the bus for more than an hour with 50 plus kids? It's horrible, and I suggest you do it. <laughs> Consolidation, debate, <laughs> <laughs> merits, and in certain communities, the big box store educational opportunities may seem like a good deal until there's nowhere left to shop and the goods cannot be afforded. Thank you. I'm just going to be very short, um, and I'm speaking solely as uh, a community member and not anybody associated with the school. I think that Act 46 had some merit. I do feel that everybody feels that this is something that's going to stuff down their throat. Um, that being said, ultimately, I can accept whatever decision is made. It's not going to be the be-all, end-all. It's not going to end our school. But what I really think needs to happen is there needs to be an end to this so that our community can start to heal. It's been very divided, and we need to end that part. Um, we need to think about the children. We need to find ways of challenging our students and taking them to the next level because as things considered, continue to consolidate in the world, everything becomes global. We are not competing with the kids next door. We are competing with the kids from across the ocean. And this is, we need to move forward, challenge our students, and get this stuff behind us. Thank you. train has left the station, but I'm asking this board to please consider. I'm here to talk about democracy. Huntington voted four times. And what is the point of voting if our votes are not listened to? The secretary's report, the post plan, said community sentiment essentially is irrelevant. I am asking the board to correct that error. Mr. Carroll pointed out that this is about the children, not about the adults. Children learn from what they see happening around them. If they see their parents and their community voting four times not to merge, and what do they learn if the merger goes ahead? What they learn 
is that the people in power will ignore the will of the voters. And that is not a lesson that anybody on this board wants children to learn. This board has a chance to inject some democracy into this process, to inject some wisdom into the process. Is it wise to force citizens into a school district where they will not have a meaningful voice? Is it wise to ignore the will of the people as expressed in four separate elections? Is it wise to eliminate public participation by moving school board meetings 23 miles from where the people live? In the name of democracy, I urge this board to reconsider and not force Huntington to merge. Carpenter for Orwell, if you could come up also in the next one. Thank you. Hey, I'm Kyle Landis Marinello, speaking in my personal capacity. I'm the parent of three wonderful children at Romney and Middlesex. They're here in the back. <laughs> we live right across the street from the school. I passionately support keeping our local school boards because that is what is best for all the children in Washington County. That's not just my opinion, that's the unanimous opinion of all six of our school boards and the opinion of all of our local representatives and senators. To understand how passionate we are about this, consider the following analogy. There are two paths leading out of this room. Imagine this path is flat, safe, and clear, and you get $10 million if you pick this path. Now look at the other path. Imagine warning signs, potholes, brambles, barbed wire, live tigers, and not a dime of money. We spent three torturous years deciding which path. When we started, I had short hair. <laughs> Instead of taking 10 million and leisurely strolling down the easy lane, we took a path with brambles, barbed wire, and live tigers. And it was every bit as brutal as it looked like it would be. We're battered, disheveled, and scarred. But we made the right choice. We know our towns, we surveyed our citizens, we talked to them, listened to them, we looked at our particular situation at this moment in time and realized our districts cannot merge, it will not work. This path is what is best for our kids. Do not pluck us away from this path and send us down the other path. We don't belong there. We chose against it even when offered $10 million. To force us there now with no incentives without our consent is unconscionable, and it won't work. We fought live tigers to get here. We intend to stay. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any live tiger stories. <laughs> um, I'll try to make this as quick as I can. Uh, I see this as a conflict on how to respond to change. Um, either you succumb to fear or you exert leadership. And I would have preferred Orwell exert leadership in this regard, and I hope you'll still have the opportunity to do so. Uh, second, I've been on the Slate Valley uh, the, the, the mud board with those 15 strangers that we're all talking about, and the collaboration's been great. They're smart folks and looking uh, for ways to further the education of all the kids in the district, not just their own. I'd like to see us follow that lead as well. Uh, third, the concerns that I've heard over and over are, quote, loss of control and loss of community. I just don't see those. Um, closing the school is a fear for sure, but a greater fear should be short sheeting the kids in Orwell because we're missing out on opportunities. Uh, fourth, uh, I have questions about uh, cutting the programs at the school. I've heard questions about cutting programs at the school, but I haven't heard a lot about adding the programs, and I fear that Orwell is stagnating. Um, the physical plant is substandard and needs a lot of work, um, and uh, there are some issues uh, as well that haven't necessarily been addressed in specifics here today. Um, fifth, uh, I think that there are improvements to education across the board that helps all the kids. Uh, we're all ending up uh, with our neighbors' kids in Fairhaven. Um, we should all uh, be working as hard as we can to improve the education for all of those. And finally, I hear a lot about the divisions that this has caused and the, the divisions that it will leave. There's no question that there have been divisions, and I've had them with some people in this room, and I've had very good conversations and very productive conversations. 
But whether those divisions persist is on the parents, and those divisions will only persist if we let them. Thank you. So uh, at this point, we are running behind. Um, but we will uh, adjourn at this point, and uh, just to give a half an hour or so. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, recess, sorry. Thank you for the attention. Trying to do math and talk at the same time. That's why I teach social studies. Um, so, yeah. right? Come on. Uh, so we will, uh, we will come back in half an hour. Recess in half an hour. I need to take a break. Thank <laughs> you.